here to talk about the topic, which I um, am very interested in trying as well. Um, and so really today we wanted to focus on care implications of opioid use disorder and family care, specifically around the office space and promoting treatment and uh, harm reduction. Um, so to start, we have no disclosures. And the learning objectives for our talk are to recognize and promote them as an effective office based opioid treatment. Um, this is pretty timely because we are implementing this in um, our IMO clinic, and it's definitely something that we would want to uh, integrate even further. Um, second, we would like to describe how to refer eligible and appropriate patients for people who are treatment at IMA. And then last, identify approaches to caring for patients who use drugs within a harm reduction framework. So first, I wanted to go um, and provide an overview of overdose deaths on a national scale. I'll go into some of the existing evidence for buprenorphine and its current clinical uses within a collaborative care model in uh, the outpatient setting. And we'll talk briefly about the treatment induction, maintenance, and intensification phases of buprenorphine. So first, uh, you may have all seen these slides before, but this is data from the CDC, uh, which shows overdose deaths primarily from opioids, uh, which includes prescription drugs, heroin, and synthetics, which includes fentanyl. Um, and if you see on the top line, uh, the any opioid um, increase is still going strong, but then if you break it down into commonly prescribed opioids, heroin, and other synthetic opioids, uh, you can see that it's really being driven by heroin and other synthetic opioids at this point. And then from looking at these more specific graphs, this is just number of deaths from prescription opioid pain relievers, which excludes non methadone synthetics. See that the, the lines are really slowing down in terms of their rate of progression and uh, maybe even plateauing for both men and women up to the year 2015. And the number of deaths from heroin and non methadone synthetics, uh, you can see that the bar continues to rise. We also have some emerging data from um, some of our colleagues in Massachusetts at Boston Medical Center where they're doing a lot of really fantastic research in collaboration with the government um, that since 2015, they're doing some pretty um, intensive collaborative data analysis where private companies, government, universities, and the city are collaborating to really try and stem the opioid epidemic. And what they have been finding um, is that opioids are commonly prescribed within one year of death, but uncommonly prescribed at the time of death. Um, only about 30% of patients who experience a non-fatal overdose are referred for treatment. And of those 30% who are engaged in treatment and receiving um, some kind of opioid agonist therapy or antagonist therapy, uh, people who are receiving methadone or buprenorphine are less likely to die in the post overdose period than those receiving naltrexone, which will not, the naltrexone piece will not be a focus of this talk, but it does exist as a therapy option. Um, I wanted to show you guys the slides, but some of the papers are in uh, publication, so it's not allowed. Um, so really, I think, importantly, we have an addiction treatment gap, and why does that exist in the U.S.? And so uh, the 2016 Surgeon General's report, based on addiction in America, some of you may have seen this, uh, reported that in 2015, in the U.S., 21.7 million Americans, which is about 8%, needed specialized treatment for a substance use disorder. And only 10% of those who were in need of treatment actually received it. So I think it's worth thinking about whether or not this would be acceptable for other chronic illnesses like hypertension and diabetes if only 10% of those patients actually got the treatment that they needed. Some other data from the American Journal of Public Health about five years ago um, showed that 2.3 million Americans over the age of 12 have an opioid use disorder, uh, but we only have treatment capacity to serve about 1.4 million. And so there's at least a treatment gap of about 1 million. Uh, and then more specifically, while only one in, while one in 112 Americans have opioid use disorder, um, we only have the capacity to treat one in 200, and then only one in 800 people actually got treatment. Um, so in addition to not having enough capacity, there are also a lot of barriers to access to treatment. Um, and just as an FYI, we'll talk more about this later, but only 2% of US physicians have a waiver to prescribe people. You do need specialized training. Um, and about 40% of that 2% are psychiatrists. Um, and it, the, the number hovers around 30% for family family medicine and internal medicine physicians who have a waiver. Um, 
So, as Jonathan mentioned, I recently came to back to Sinai from the Bronx, and I was working in a community health clinic there in the South Bronx. And, you know, I put up this slide, this is the New York Times, uh, maybe a few months ago, uh, because I, I think it's important to be reminded of how the opioid epidemic has disproportionately affected certain communities, um, and in particular communities of color. And where we were working in the South Bronx, we were seeing a tremendous amount of overdose deaths um, that were affecting the black community and also the Latino community in the South Bronx. And for many years, uh, opioid treatment was uh, an issue that was criminalized, uh, or opioid use was criminalized, um, and many people who needed treatment uh, were incarcerated rather than uh, being shunted towards treatment centers. And that actually has been changing in the past few decades, which is uh, really wonderful. Um, but I think, you know, some of these needle exchange programs uh, and community-based organizations that have really struggled to advocate for this population um, are only recently getting the, uh, the light that they deserve in the media and also in uh, the government. And so this is just a quote from one of my mentors at Montefiore, Dr. Shanassa Cunningham, who um, was quoted in this article. Um, so she says, it had been a really big problem for years, but nobody cared because a very specific idea of what a drug user looked like. It's about time to see the shift from incarceration to treatment, but it's bittersweet because it's clear that the reason it's happening now is that it's affecting communities that are white and affluent. So I think it's just something to keep in mind um, as we talk a little bit more about what we're doing with their INA. Um, and lastly, have you guys seen this documentary? It's really um, incredibly powerful, and it talks a lot about um, you know the, the shift from slavery and Jim Crow to mass incarceration and the ways in which drug policy reform really uh, negatively impacted a lot of communities of color um, who are also poor. But it's called 13th and it's directed by Ava DuVernay, who also directed Salva. So I really encourage you to watch it. Okay, so uh, now that we've talked about this gap, how do we think about closing it? Uh, so we need to really expand access to all kinds of addiction <coughs> treatment and move this quote unquote specialized treatment to primary care. The goal is really to train providers and build up primary care infrastructure. Uh, it is also to increase housing and employment opportunities, support diversionary programs, and alternatives to incarceration. And at the same time, we need to offer services to reduce the harms associated with drug use for people who are not currently seeking treatment or cannot access treatment. And um, I'll offer this brief definition, but Trang will go into this further in the second half of the talk, but <coughs> harm reduction really refers to a range of services and policies uh, that lessen the adverse consequences of drug use and protect public health. Unlike approaches that insist that people stop using drugs, harm reduction acknowledges that many people are not able or willing to abstain from illicit drug use and that abstinence should not be a precondition for health. And so this concept of harm reduction and treatment is um, one that is not mutually exclusive, and that's something that we need to continue to emphasize throughout the presentation. So I wanted to start with a case because we'll refer back to this patient throughout the presentation. Um, and this is somebody who everybody can likely see is a 35-year-old man with chronic hepatitis C, occasional alcohol use, which is established there. He has a history of depression and generalized anxiety disorder. He uses uh, one to three bags of heroin daily, occasionally by Trendadome, and purchase it on the street. And it's coming to me because he's contemplative about stopping his use. So how can we care for this patient, and what are his options for treatment? So I think it's first important to remind ourselves how to diagnose this patient and the DSM-5 criteria for opioid use disorder, which also can be used for any other substances. Um, but you know, this, a patient like this will meet criteria if at least two of the following of the list that you see here occur in a 12-month period. And I think we're all familiar um, with these with the list because it's been included in DSM-4 as well. Um, and you really need a minimum of uh, two criteria uh, for mild substance or opioid use disorder. And then uh, if you have more, then it's moderate to severe. Um, and just a note in the, you see at the bottom, uh, well, I guess this is not totally working, but uh, points 10 and 11 talk about tolerance and withdrawal. Um, and just to be clear, these criteria are not considered to be met for individuals taking opioids solely under appropriate medical supervision. Um, so this patient would meet uh, the definition for opioid use disorder. And then we can talk about what his options are. So one of them is opioid detox. And we know from numerous studies 
that um, opioid detoxification outcomes are not so great. So there are very low rates of retention in treatment and high rates of relapse post-treatment. Less than 50% are abstinent at six months and less than 15% are abstinent at 12 months. And there are also increased rates of overdose due to decreased tolerance. And I think this is thus uh, reflected in the post-incarceration period. Um, and there's a great study uh, published now 10 years ago uh, uh, from our colleagues at University of Washington that really look at mortality rates among former inmates of the Washington State Department of Corrections. And they followed them up um, for over nine weeks. And you can see in the second bar that two weeks after release, their, um, their mortality rate is <coughs> alarmingly high compared to the average rate um, which of the of Washington um, state citizens, which is represented by the dash line. Um, so there, it's high on average, but more specifically, it, it's higher in the post two week period. And a lot of that is attributed to overdose deaths related to um, opioid use after incarceration during a period uh, where they are no longer tolerated. Some of the reasons for relapse, there's a protracted withdrawal syndrome uh, in which patients feel delays, fatigue, insomnia, very poor tolerance to stress and pain, and a lot of cravings for opioid use. There are condition cues or triggers, um, and also priming with small doses of drugs. So really the goal um, for a lot of these patients for treatment is pharmacotherapy. And the ones that I'll focus on today are buprenorphine, and I'll just briefly um, talk about methadone since it is something uh, pretty widespread, especially um, in the methadone programs or opioid treatment programs here at uh, in New York. And the goals of pharmacotherapy are really to alleviate physical withdrawal, block opioid receptors, alleviate craving. And this is just a, um, a schematic to show that there are three different stages. And um, really the goal of opioid agonist treatment is to get people back into that normal bar in the middle um, and to stave off withdrawal and also block the So in the 1960s, um, Dr. Dole and his wife, Marie Nyslander, also a doctor at Rockefeller University, developed methadone. Um, and they showed successfully that treating heroin uh, users with methadone can uh, block receptors and reduce cravings. Um, and you know, subsequently after that, we had all these congressional laws that put into place the opioid treatment programs that we now know as methadone programs. Um, and so methadone is great because it decreases heroin and other drug use, HIV and hepatitis B two infection, crime, um, and also mortality from opioid use disorder. It does also increase retention and treatment, uh, obstetric and birth outcomes, and overall survival. But there are certain limitations. It's highly regulated. But there's limited access. It's inconvenient and occasionally uh, can be grievously prohibited. And oftentimes the program is too unstable and unsafe for patients. And a lot of my patients. Um, sometimes do come in for a buprenorphine treatment, saying that they there's a lot of stigma still when they go to a, uh, a methadone program. So, and so really, we needed newer treatment options, and buprenorphine is one of them. And I'll briefly just touch upon the uh, combinations that we have. Uh, but buprenorphine is either available in a generic monotherapy form, standalone, or it's uh, available co-formulated with naloxone, which is the opioid antagonist, <coughs> um, and that is called Suboxone. It's a Schedule three drug, and it has less potential for misuse than Schedule one or two. Um, it is. It comes in sublingual tablets or film, and it's uh, FDA approved for treatment of opioid use disorder. It is a partial agonist at the mean opioid receptor, different from methadone, which is a full agonist. It has very high receptor affinity and a slow dissociation, um, and mild withdrawal symptoms, and very low risk of overdose. It has a ceiling effect for respiratory depression, which I think um, I'll show you in a graph what that means and how it differs from the full agonist. It's usually combined in a 4 to 1 ratio with naloxone to reduce the risk of misuse. Um, when you take it sublingually, uh, the buf is absorbed, but the naloxone is not. If it is injected, naloxone is rapidly bioavailable and will facilitate its withdrawal. Um, and we really only use buf uh, alone, model therapy in pregnancy, given that there's uh, uh, naloxone as a medical issue. This is just a uh, a diagram showing the differences between uh, an opioid antagonist, partial agonist, and full agonist. So buprenorphine is the partial agonist. It binds to the same receptors as, uh, as agonist, um, but it has this ceiling effect. And the response curve flattens out more quickly than a full agonist, um, and it 
which is sort of maximum activation and a lower dose. This is what it looks like, the film on the left and the tablets on the right. Um, and so the data for buprenorphine exists, and I'll only speak to the uh, goal and time rate there. Initially, it was studied for uh, primary care-based detoxification. They found that short-term detox was successful, but long-term outcomes were poor. Um, and subsequently, they've been doing a lot of trials looking at primary care maintenance treatment. Um, notably, methadone cannot be done in an outpatient due to federal restrictions. But buprenorphine has an improved safety profile and was found to be as effective in specialized programs. Um, Follow-up trials show efficacy in primary care settings. Um, and this is a trial that was done by uh, Patrick O'Connor and his colleagues at Yale. And really, they were looking at um, whether or not buprenorphine treatment in a primary care setting versus in a methadone program would be equally as effective. It was a randomized trial, and they looked at retention outcomes during the 12 week study. And they found that retention during the 12 week study was higher in the primary care setting than in um, a drug treatment setting like a methadone program. <coughs> and patients who had been in primary care had lower rates of OD based on their third toxicology. This is another graph showing, so the top line is retention in a primary care clinic for uh, the patients using buprenorphine, and then the bottom line is um, if you were receiving buprenorphine at a methadone program. So you can see that uh, the retention was higher in the primary care. In 2000, Bill Clinton signed in the Data Act um, and essentially allowed physicians to obtain special training to prescribe buprenorphine. There's an eight-hour training program for doctors and MDs, and then a 24-hour training for MDs and PAs. You could also uh, be eligible to prescribe if you got board certified in addiction psychiatry or medicine, or addiction medicine. Um, and then in 2002, Suboxone, which is buprenorphine naloxone, was FDA approved for opioid maintenance and detox. There is a limit, however, uh, to 30 patients per waiver physician in, the first, uh, in your first year of practice, and then you can apply for an increase to about 100 patients after year one. I just think it's interesting that there are still a lot of restrictions for buprenorphine, and we have no restrictions for uh, at this point for how we prescribe hydromorphone, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and sort of a full opioid access. Um, so in clinical practice, we really use it for patients with opioid use disorder. It can also be used uh, for patients with opioid use disorder and chronic pain, um, and it can be used off-label for patients with chronic pain that is not focused on just off. Um, it does require regular close follow-up with a waiver physician, often monthly, um, and it's offered in conjunction with mental health treatment, counseling, and support groups, ideally. Um, some of the eligibility criteria, so inclusion, uh, for the type of diagnosis, if you should be interested in treatment, you have to be over the age of 18 or an emancipated minor, it doesn't make sense. You have to apply, be able to comply with treatment program policies, and ideally you should be on a methadone dose of less than 60 milligrams a day or fewer than seven bags daily. There are better outcomes if there is good family and social support, stable housing, and mental health treatment. But of course, if those are not present, that is not a contraindication to starting. Um, exclusion criteria includes severe hepatic dysfunction, uh, alcohol use disorder, or benzodiazepine use disorder by DSM-5, active <coughs> suicidal ideation, unstable psychiatric um, disease, higher dose of methadone or opioid analgesic doses, um, and also notably, patients with pain requiring chronic use. So I'll just give you the basics of the criteria. Yeah. But um, I, I would imagine that using buprenorphine is better than using opiates to prevent it, right? Yeah. So yeah. Has, I wonder if there's been any studies that have looked at like, maybe a real reason why, or is it just because we... Part of the issue is that, um, <coughs> you mean like high dose method or opioid analgesic? No, like benzos. Like oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a lot of people have both yeah. things going on. And yeah. So there, there are actually um, a lot of people who are moving the practice towards offering buprenorphine for patients who are on high doses of opioid analgesics that are not safe. And so if they're on an MME greater than 90, um, uh, I was just at this conference where they did a workshop on how to taper, to taper opioid analgesics, and several of the, um, the leading clinicians and experts on that panel have been suggesting us to really have a conversation with our patients about moving to buprenorphine um, for treatment of both coexisting pain and also concern <laughs> for high doses of opioid analgesics. So I think what Juan is trying to say is that uh, we do have to accommodate benzodiazepines. It's not really, in, in the training that you receive at least, the way that you're doing, it's not a true contraindication. 
So, I mean, some of our patients have been uh, benzodiazepines, but really I think that the exclusive criteria is was a use disorder, um, where it would be sort of, you know, an area where they may be better for methadone or more like organized structured programs. Um, one of the models of care that we will hopefully be implementing here at IMA is a collaborative care model. Um, it is something that has been championed and implemented successfully in Massachusetts. Um, and at the, specifically at the Boston Medical Center. And really the idea is that you have an RN who uh, plays a very pivotal role in providing this collaborative care and administrating integrated therapy. Um, so what that means is that the RN does intake visits, induction, which I'll talk about with OSIP and an MD, follow-up visits every month. Um, and then they also can manage relapse, provide harm reduction counseling, and program coordination. And if there is an RN or an intermediate care coordinator, see the patient every other month with the MD. <coughs> Sometimes the MD visits can be stretched out to every three months. So back to our patient. Um, so would this person be appropriate for buprenorphine? How to start it and then how should we follow up with you? So I think this is someone who probably would be an appropriate candidate for buprenorphine. Uh, he's you know only occasionally buying methadone. He's not on a high dose um, of heroin every day. Seems to has a history of depression um, but seems to be um, doing okay and not so unstable, and he does want to stop using. And so when we think about starting with there, um, there's an induction phase, and this is really important because a patient needs to be in an opioid-free state and be mild to moderate withdrawal before starting. Um, if they are not in an opioid-free state, then there is a risk of a precipitated withdrawal, um, given that buprenorphine can displace the full agonist. Um, so then how do you choose home versus office induction? So buprenorphine is electronically prescribed. It's a controlled substance. Um, oftentimes we will prescribe it to the pharmacy for the patient to pick it up. And either they can come back to office for an induction uh, with us um, in a supervised setting, or they can just take it at home. Most of my patients actually have a history of using street buprenorphine, so they're very familiar with the way it works. Um, so those are the patients who I think, you know, most often Based induction, and there are studies looking at the efficacy between home and office based induction, and patients by and large prefer home induction. But for office induction, those are really the patients who maybe have been on methadone for a really long time, have never you know, been in withdrawal, or are really anxious about being in withdrawal, um, and so, and or they just think they may be complicated because of their unstable social situation, then you can bring them in for an office induction. Um, and the plan is really to, for the patients to start using the medication with a plan for close follow-up during the titration phase until they reach a stable dose. Once they're stable, they enter into a maintenance phase and they can be seen monthly thereafter. And if they're stable, um, you know, they can be seen every two to three months. So uh, this is sort of a, you can't really see this, but this is just a schematic to suggest that, you know, we at IMA will do a pre-induction visit with our patients and then once, after they're induced, we will follow up with them uh, pretty regularly, often um, every three to five days or every one to two weeks until they're at a stable dose and doing fine. And then they get punted down to this maintenance phase where we'll see them every month. Uh, going back to the bottom, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about maintenance versus taper because some people have questions about it. Uh, really, I think when we're looking at the being maintenance treatment, we're not really tapering any of our patients. Uh, we know from some studies that tapering adverse outcomes, including relapse, um, and this is a, a small randomized control trial of heroin users um, mm -hmm. that was published in the dictionary a few years ago, um, who had been randomized to either 16 milligrams of buprenorphine versus six-day tape regression, followed by placebo. They both got psychotherapy, and you can see that um, for over a period of 52 weeks, the uh, persons who were randomized to buprenorphine, 75% of them were still where 0% of the taper patients remain in treatment. Um, and 70, about 75 of the buprenorphine patients had negative urine toxicology <coughs> and follow up. So, and on a public health level, we know that buprenorphine saves lives. This was a longitudinal time sequence series analysis done um, out of Baltimore, which examined the association between heroin overdose and expansion of methadone and buprenorphine. The red bar is heroin 
primarily what we really accept. And then the green dashed line, uh, which goes up after the year 2002, which is after Suboxone was made available, um, is our preferred marketing patients. And then the blue line at the top, our method of patients, and you can see that there is a negative correlation. Um, there's fewer heroin overdose deaths with the rise of the drug use method. So uh, three months later, the patient has been on a stable dose of 16 milligrams daily, but experiences a death in the family, and has worsening depression and anxiety. Additionally, his conflict with his partner has unstable housing. He admits that he um, was staying with a friend who was a trigger for abuse, and he stopped a few months ago because we were using heroin again. He has two appointments with you, and he's here to discuss the starting. So uh, what should we do next? So there's also um, a treatment intensification phase for patients who may have relapse. And I think an important conversation to have is really um, to be open and um, as honest as possible with your patient and say, you know, this is a chronic illness. There will be relapses. Just like, you know, our patients with diabetes will have elevated A1Cs every once in a while. Um, and so even if you have an unexpected urine drug testing result, um, we should be communicating with our patients that um, we will continue to treat you and not abandon you. So some of this may mean more frequent visits with the provider, looking at urine drug testing for safety purposes and to talk about what's going on at home, um, and also to address other trichosis and medical issues. In some cases, um, we may not be able to provide all the services that a patient may need um, during the relapse phase. Um, and so when primary care phase is not enough, uh, we have partnered with our colleagues at the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai West, St. Luke's, and Beth Israel uh, to provide referral pathways for patients who need more services. And so this may mean office based in treatment with intensive outpatient programs where they come every week uh, or twice weekly. They could also get new milk and epidemic though at an opioid treatment program, or they may be switched to methadone. And this can be temporary um, once patients stabilize. Um, and whatever social situation is reversed, uh, they can come back to the office and see the primary So very briefly, I just wanted to show you a diagram of how we uh, envisioned the way we can look at look at IMA. And really, you can see that um, we've been doing expert screening, um, this species here, and some of our patients who screen positive for substance use disorder, specifically opioid use disorder, can be referred to our REACH program, which is I will talk more about later. And our buprenorphine treatment program sits underneath the umbrella of NICH, um, which also pers uh, provides other comprehensive services for persons who use drugs. And the primary care provider and the team can also make referrals to, to the REACH program, um, and then that patient can then get We are also trying to collaborate with our colleagues um, at other specialties in the camp building at Sinai and also in to get referrals for patients. Um, and so this may mean uh, patients who present to the ED with an overdose um, or a near fatal overdose um, can be um, hopefully in the near future started on buprenorphine and then linked to primary care here. Um, and there are many syringe exchange programs for open patients that we find close to the patients that we need um, to get referrals. So I'll turn it over to Tim to talk about health addiction. Okay. Um, so Basically, the second half of uh, the conversation is going to shift a little bit uh, towards harm reduction, uh, just because I think it, in some scenarios, uh, buprenorphine, often buprenorphine is going to be a specialized service that uh, myself and Linda will be providing for the short term, and uh, Kelsey and Warren will be not as many will be doing it. So I just wanted to talk about harm reduction at IMA, um, harm reduction skills that all of us are currently already have. At to practice. And then I'll also be closing out with an introduction to the REACH program, what it means, what services are available, how they refer to us, uh, and introducing our staff. And then um, talk about some of the specialized services that we are currently um, providing uh, as part of REACH, but also as part of the wider IMA uh, uh, initiatives. So returning to our patient's case, um, and this is actually uh, based on a real patient of mine. Um, so Despite all of our efforts to intensify his buprenorphine treatment, um, he has just really been spiraling out of control. He's been continuously using heroin on a daily basis. And despite multiple referrals to um, elsewhere, like the Addiction Institute, to methadone programs, to mental health, he's just 
never really made it to any of these appointments, has always had excuses, but he continuously comes back to you to seek care. Um, so what do you do? Right? This, I think, is a, a illustrative case in which we as physicians feel very high anxiety, very frustrated with because we've been trained to cure patients, to help them, and then this is a patient that comes in and is doing everything wrong, right? And so, uh, for me, this is actually a very hopeful case, and this is the type of case that actually um, excites me because the fact that he's coming back means that he trusts you, that he really is seeking help, but he just hasn't been able to put it together yet. And so what can we do at IMA to help this patient along with his journey of just being open to receiving help to being open to stop using drugs? So, We've talked about slightly before harm reduction. Linda provided a definition of harm reduction. But in essence, it's everything that we can do to help reduce um, the self-harm and the psychosocial uh, impact of drug use on our patients. And in real life, uh, harm reduction comes in many forms. It comes in opiate agonist therapy, uh, just as <coughs> you know, buprenorphine methadone, as Linda described. It also comes in needle and syringe exchange programs, as well as you know, as a clinic providing clean needles and clean syringes for patients when they ask. This is a, actually a directory of all of the needle and syringe exchange programs currently in New York City. And it really was uh, motivating for me to see that it was a really long list. So if any one of our patients ever come in and ask for clean needles, we can refer them to, to this directory. Supervised injection facilities is a, a controversial topic here in America. It's actually illegal, but has been uh, widely discussed in Europe and, and Canada has actually had multiple uh, programs in Europe that have shown success in reducing mortality and getting patients in, in linked to care. Um, basically, as the name implies, is where patients come in uh, and be monitored while they're using heroin or, or uh, other substances. Um, and then harm reduction also can come in very simple forms such as PrEP, naloxone kits, um, and then last but not least, I want to talk about uh, this new and emerging concept in, in America about low threshold primary care clinics where patients can just walk in uh, to receive services from primary care doctors. So some of the highlights of harm reduction principles, I really wanted to bring it up here because I think um, it contrasts a little bit with uh, our traditional method of thinking about medicine. Um, but I, there's, this was a, a list of... Um, principles that was outlined by the Harm Reduction International Group in their physician statement. Um, one thing to note is that there's no uh, one formula for doing harm reduction. Um, if it was, it would be less challenging for us. But um, there are some very fundamental principles that uh, adheres to the harm reduction framework. One of which is accepting people who use drugs as they are. I think that's a really, really uh, critical Part of harm reduction is just accepting patients when they walk in, even if they're not ready for buprenorphine treatment, even if they're not ready to stop using drugs right away. As Linda said before, addiction treatment and, and harm reduction are not mutually exclusive. Um, sorry, this is a little blurry, but this came from um, a, a group at Public Health Reports, and basically it contrasts what, uh, what the traditional healthcare model looks like and what the harm reduction model looks like. And there's a little bit of um, areas where I think we are not very familiar with. For example, in the harm reduction model, um, it's really more patient-centric. It's really about accepting the patient as they are, where they are. Um, it's about providing information to patients and being a collaborative decision-making process where we provide you know, the risks and benefits of options and then letting the patients decide for themselves what they want to do which is very different from what we're trained to do in primary care in the traditional model, which is basically a very prescriptive model where it's hierarchical. We're the doctors, we're telling you what's good for you, and then um, if you're adherent, then you're, la you're labeled as good to patient, and if you're not adherent, you're labeled as non-compliant. You know, there's, there's punitive effects for patients that are not adherent to that. Okay, so it's more physician-centric. Um, that being said, though, like the, I think switching over from the traditional model over to the harm reduction model is challenging because our, our healthcare system is structured in such a way that you know we do want to be objective and we do want to um, be prescriptive in, in some manner. So just thinking about 
realistically what harm reduction looks like uh, in a primary care clinic. And so this is a checklist that was uh, published in the British Medical Journal of very simple things that we can do in a primary care clinic uh, to adhere to the uh, harm reduction framework. So first of all, just taking a, uh, a, a um, comprehensive addiction history of our patients, just getting to understand what compels them to use, uh, what is their environment like at home. A lot of my patients tell me, I want to stop, but everybody around me is using, and it's really hard to say no, right? So understanding our patient as a whole person is, is already a harm reduction model because that's how we're going to help the patient if we can address their psychosocial um, needs. Assessing readiness for treatment, so continuously every time asking them, you know, what do you, what is your goals, what do you want to do in the next month, what do you want to do in the next three months, uh, and then helping them when they're ready. Um, offering treatment options, uh, low threshold, so buprenorphine uh, programs here, and then uh, opi opioid antagonist therapy when the patient's more stable. Um, like I said, accounting for mental health needs, psychosocial needs is also super important. Overdose prevention um, strategies that we can uh, apply here in Mount Sinai and in IMA. Um, having a risk reduction plan with patients, uh, counseling them about how we can minimize the risk of an overdose at home. Um, response plan, having naloxone kits available to give to the patient quickly, which I'll talk about in a, a couple of minutes. And then safe storage and disposal of drugs so that other people are not um, adversely affected if they happen to, um, you know, Come across the turn across the drugs. Um, one thing that we um, often overlook is actually infection prevention. A lot of my patients uh, continue to inject, um, and so skin care, um, talking about safe injection methods, uh, providing alcohol um, ads for our patients, um, STI screening, TB screening, uh, vaccinations for any infectious disease, that's, uh, and then also hepatitis treatment. Prep is also something that. We'll, uh, we think about it more in the HIV world, but um, it's something as primary care doctors we, we also do. We can also do to provide um, harm reduction for our patients. And then, last but not least, I think this has been a, a, a great success for us in IMA Labor um, that we're hoping to expand to the beach program is just having a multidisciplinary team for case management and to help support the patient as as a whole. Because we realize that oftentimes it's not just the medical needs; it's the psycho psychiatric needs, it's the social needs really puts together the motivations and, and the barriers for why uh, we use uh, substances. So why harm reduction? Um, I, th I don't think needless to say, I think we're all convinced that harm reduction is a good uh, principle to follow. Um, I just wanted to provide some evidence that it actually had that tr uh, disease transmission is also cost effective and saves lives. Um, and it works. So this was an article that was near and dear to my heart because it's about hepatitis C and how um, just simple harm reduction measures such as needle and syringe programs and opioid substitution therapies can prevent um, HCV transmission. So this was a meta-analysis um, that was done from studies from across the, the world, so Australia, North America, Europe, and it showed significant risk reduction in hepatitis C transmission uh, in these programs. Now, this paper was way above my pay grade, and I really fully don't understand a lot of what it said, but the gist of it was that in the HIV community, um, this meta-analysis, uh, the HIV community in the United States, this meta-analysis showed that opiate substitution therapy, needle syringe programs, PrEP, uh, just the you know, early screening of HIV uh, diseases actually can prevent uh, HIV infections, and over the course of 20 years, through their theoretical model, can significantly decrease the prevalence of HIV <coughs> by almost up to 17%, and that can translate to around a $30 billion um, cost savings uh, in 20 years. And then last but not least, this is a uh, meta-analysis of all programs throughout the United States that uh, provided take-home naloxone kits to patients um, that show that it um, is very effective in reversing overdose. So, uh, over 20-something studies, some studies had thousands of kits that were given out to patients, and of those studies, around 60% uh, of the kits were used, and, and yet, only in one study, only 10 patients died, whereas everyone else, you see, like one, two, or, or zero patients died. 
um, and the reversal rate was very, very high. So um, as low as 83% in that study with the 10 deaths, and then as high as 100%. So despite the evidence showing that harm reduction does really work, saves lives, is cost effective, there's actually a lot of barriers and challenges to applying harm reduction in real life. Um, <coughs> Patient-centric barriers include you know, there's still a lot of stigma, still a lot of fear and mistrust. Unfortunately, because of the criminalization of drug use uh, in the past 20, 30 years, a lot of times we are grouped in as the bad guys, um, and the patients are not as forthcoming about their drug use when, when they come into the clinic. Um, there's also competing priorities, and like I said, environment is really, really big. When we talk, we think about uh, our patients' home environment, what it looks like, Bronx, Harlem, you know, who else around them is using drugs, and this is all competing priorities for, for them seeking care. And then for us, you know, we all can sort of relate to the lack of time that we have in clinic, a 15-minute visit. We're obviously not going to address that checklist that we saw previously. Um, lack of training knowledge. And then provider discomfort in talking about a very stigmatizing and sensitive issue such as drug use, right? And then um, small percentage of uh, providers out there that uh, have been pulled that showed that still adhere to this perception that harm reduction equals to us telling them that it's okay to use drugs. Um, so, just talking about um, provider systems and like uh, and how we talk about harm reduction and talk about drug use actually is an, another barrier. So, as I mentioned, stigma is a huge problem, um, especially um, in around the opioid epidemic. Now we're seeing news reports and everything that's coming out about the opioid epidemic. And in some ways, it's, it's, it's a good thing. It's really highlighting um, the needs, the, the treatment gap. And in some other ways, it's actually um, more stigmatizing for our patients. Um, so I pulled up these two articles from the New York Times, which arguably is one of the more progressive uh, papers right now. But still, you can see the language that's being used, war on drugs and the addicts. You know, it is still juxtaposing um, a negative connotation uh, with with uh, drug use uh, and substance use. So, you know, one of the simplest way and a low hanging fruit that we all as providers can do is try to reduce the stigma. Is, is uh, just shifting our language a little bit on how and shifting our approach to patients with substance use. So instead of using stigmatizing language like drug addict or clean and dirty toxicology. And using like really uh, derogatory uh, terms like junk, uh, crackhead, junkie, tweaker. You know, obviously we're not obvious with that in the clinic, but you know, just, just, just thinking about that, um, those terminology, it's very stigmatizing to our patients, and shifting our language over to um, more objective language like if this person used heroin or cocaine or used use, um, and classifying addiction as a substance use disorder. And um, so, like I mentioned, the goal uh, of harm reduction and the goal of everything that we're doing here at Mount Sinai right now, especially the REACH program, is to shift the balance between from a lot of barriers to patients receiving um, substance use care here uh, in primary care uh, to making it more facilitative for our patients. So providing a comprehensive, supportive, harm reduction um, focused program. That's where we come in. Um, so this is an introduction to us as the REACH program. So REACH stands for the Respectful and Equitable Access to Comprehensive Healthcare Program. And this is basically uh, an expansion and a rebranding of sorts. You know, this is INA Liver just uh, expanding our scope to uh, patients who have active substance use. So we take a patient-centered harm reduction approach. Uh, we provide primary care services to our patients. Um, uh, and um, basically, we have four goals, but no, the number one goal is to provide comprehensive hepatitis C and primary care services to our patients in our community. And where we came from, so this is a slide of IMA liver. Um, all of our um, efforts in the last year, uh, from November 2016 to, to October 2017. Um, in that year alone, we had over 300 referrals from um, the Mount Sinai Beth Israel Opioid Treatment Programs, um, and linkage to care was around 50%. 
So of those 300 that was referred, we actually had uh, 200 patients that screened positive for hepatitis C, and then 350 patients um, that also received hep C screening, I mean hep C RNA testing through our, our program. Of those, 500 patients have uh, been treated in our program, and 200 patients have been confirmed as cured of hepatitis C in one year alone. And so building on the success of that, our, our, our program really wanted to see how else we can provide services to our patients. What happened was a lot of our patients came to us for six months and a year, really developed a rapport and a trust with our, uh, our, our team, and then cured them of the hepatitis C and said, um, okay, go back to your primary care. And that just felt really unsatisfactory to us. So we wanted to develop a more comprehensive program that could care for the patient longitudinally even after they cured hepatitis C. But we also realized that there was this growing need to care for patients with substance use. A lot of our patients from the hepatitis C clinic had uh, substance use, but then a lot of patients that were coming to us that was getting screens, that screens negative, had active substance use and didn't have a primary care. So um, those are some of the reasons why we expanded REACH. Now, talking about the program services that we're going to provide, we're still going to do our hepatitis C screening, linkage to care and treatment um, at IMA. It's still uh, going to be um, you know, our foundation, what we've been successful at. We were formerly known as IMA Liver because of that. Now we're going to switch over, and everybody's going to be uh, calling our program REACH, hopefully very soon. Um, in addition, we're going to provide primary care for, for persons with drug use. Like I said, um, I'm going to have a panel of primary care patients, and Linda is going to be part of our group, so she also has a panel of primary care patients who uses substances. Um, naloxone kit distribution, buprenorphine treatment, social work, psychology services, and patient navigation. I'm going to take a brief moment to introduce our staff. So our program director is sitting over here, Dr. Weiss. Hello. Hello. Um, our medical providers, myself, Linda, also David. David was here. Yep, yeah, here. Here you go. David's our MP. And then um, we're going to have two other providers, uh, Dr. Chasen, Dr. Spoken, and then Dr. Fear is downstairs in the Jack Martin clinic, and he's uh, been very helpful for us. Our social worker who's not here today is Katie. She's really tremendously helpful um, and great. Our nurse, Martha. And then all of our navigators, who really keeps the clinic going, calls the patient, reminds the patient, drags them into the clinic sometimes. Um, one of whom is here, Shreya. She's going to represent the navigators today. Um, but we also have five others, so Fair, Wilma, Natalia, Genesis. And then Amanda, is she still here? No, so Amanda is sort of like the, the data person, our, our, our tech bureau, and also our um, marketing bureau. Um, so Jack of all trades. She was here, I think she left. So I'm going to highlight a couple of programs that we are uh, concurrently running right now um, outside of the uh, hepatitis C services. So the naloxone distribution. Um, I think some of you have heard about this. I think I've given training to many uh, in this room already. Um, but basically, we got a grant from the New York City Department of Health to distribute free kits to patients. Um, in order to get, distribute the kits, um, the provider has to finish a train the trainer training, which is the most repetitive name I've ever heard. But it's it's a 15 to 20 minute training that gets completed, and then then you can go out and provide the naloxone kits and education to overdose uh, prevention education to the patient. Um, furthermore, I've also start uh, started training all of the RNs in the firm. So many of the RNs have received this training, and they have been given kits to provide to patients. So if you have not received the training, um, that's another source uh, for the kit. So this is what the kit looks like. It has two Narcan um, doses in it, and um, you could get it from myself, from my team, and then also, like I said, from the RNs. Um, I do advise, though, that you uh, get the train, the trainer training, so that you can also do the kit directly yourself. The other thing that we're launching that's brand new is the support uh, group that our social worker Katie is going to lead at its first of its kind at, uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital. Like the entire institution, this is the first of its kind. Um, it's going to be weekly on Wednesdays from 4 to 5 p.m. Um, it is non referral, so you can just basically give out this handout and like ask patients to show up. There's no appointments necessary, there's no sign up necessary. 
um, but refreshments will be provided, and it's basically just a supportive environment for patients to discuss everything that uh, revolves around the substance use. And then um, the last thing I want to mention is our Drug User Health Capacity Building Initiative that we're partnering with the uh, New York State DOH and the um, AIDS Institute. So basically, we're one of 11 other institutions in New York State that um, are doing this initiative to try to build uh, low-threshold primary care for uh, uh, active substance users. And so um, a lot of that's going to include staff assessments, patient uh, satisfaction assessments, organizational assessments. And today we're going to ask um, some of you a favor to fill out the um, staff assessments on your way out. Uh, basically, just uh, your baseline attitudes, knowledge, beliefs of, of, of stigma and uh, of substance use. Um, so if you have time to fill it out, it's like five to ten minutes. I mean, what, five minutes maybe total? And it uh, would be really helpful. And it's completely anonymous, goes straight to the DOH, and we have nothing to do with the data entry. So, have you heard about our program? I'm sure the next burning question is, how do I get my patients in this wonderful program? Because um, <laughs> referring to patients right now is actually um, going to be a lot of email-based. Um, we were finally able to, to test and, and um, got it working is our hashtag reach email. So basically, just type in hashtag space R-E-A-C-H, and then email us your referral. So basic information about the patient, um, name, medical record number, what substance going, uh, what substance they're using, and if they're interested in buprenorphine, if it's an opioid uh, uh, overuse disorder, and then the best contact information. So please, 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 that's like the most important thing. Half the time we can't reach the patient um, because their number and everything is wrong. And then um, we'll do the triaging once you've referred the patient to us, and we'll decide whether or not the patient can receive treatment at IMA in the REACH program or if their needs are so extensive that they need to uh, be sent to the Addiction Institute uh, or elsewhere. Um, and if, you know, part of our goal is also to extend education. So if you're interested in becoming a prescriber, our goal is to actually not just have everything from table use, but also expand it to the rest of IA, to GIM. Um, please email me and let me know. There will be an upcoming training at Mount Sinai, the date is to be determined. And then there are other training opportunities available through um, the online website. We also have um, close partnerships with um, other local New York institutions. Have started a conversation with some of our friends at Rikers. So also links to care for the formerly incarcerated, um, and we're also supporting other local initiatives to reduce uh, the harms associated with drug use. Just wanted to end by showing you this really cool uh, program at the Boston um, Homeless Program. Uh, it's called SPOT. It's a supportive place for observation and treatment, and it's basically a place where after you use heroin or any other drug. You Go and get monitored, right? They go field to a blood pressure monitor, the pulse ox, um, and then they do a lot of counseling and they plug you into treatment. They've had over 3,000 encounters, almost 500 unique visitors. About uh, most of the patients spend about four hours there. They've used naloxone over 300 times and they've avoided 1,200 unique visits. Nine percent of their patients have been connected to treatment, and 13 percent have been connected to healthcare. And this is a really amazing initiative because I think it's really taking, again, um, the model of criminalization and really changing it to treatment. Um, mm -hmm. And they actually are right next door to the syringe exchange program uh, as well. Um, and so, you know, Trang had mentioned that this controversial idea of a supervised injection facility, we're not there yet legally, uh, but this is a really nice program that is in between. A lot of our community-based organizations include local New York, New York Farm Reduction Educators, the Washington Heights Corner Project, and St. Anne's Corner Farm Reduction. Um, so in summary, uh, buprenorphine is an effective treatment for opioid use disorder that can be managed in the primary care setting. Patients who screen positive for an opioid use disorder or other substance use disorder can be referred to our REACH program for evaluation, risk reduction, counseling, and treatment. And harm reduction is effective in the treatment of substance use disorder. We're not here ready for treatment. So thank you.